Thank you, Jonathan. It is a pleasure for me to be able to be with you tonight as we will be studying together from the Word of God. Uh, we're going to be looking, beginning at least, with Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 1, and so you might be turning to that point as somewhat of a launching pad for our study together this evening. I want to take just a moment to make a couple of comments with regard to the week, and then we'll get into the lesson, and when we offer the invitation, we will be concluded with our part. We have thoroughly enjoyed our time here these few days. As I've said before, we've been here enough that, uh, well, for example, when we were having lunch Sunday, it was suggested that the visitors go to the front of the line. I said, we're not visitors here anymore. <laughs> we, we feel like we're just part of the family here. Uh, we love and appreciate you. We learned early on to love and appreciate the eldership of this congregation and to be with them and their families again this week and to be with, with uh, Jonathan and his family as much as possible, although Kelly's been hindered the last couple of days with a sick child. But nevertheless, it's been good to be with them to get to know many of you better. We've been in, in some of the homes, and we have thoroughly enjoyed that time together uh, to get to know you much, much better than we did before. As we've stated earlier, I hope, and it is our desire, to be back uh, down this way in a couple of months which, with your lectureship. Uh, not that we are participating this year, but listen, you have a great lectureship here. And it's uh, certainly one that we enjoy uh, just uh, being able to sit in the audience and, and hear great men proclaim the Word of God. It, it's just a very refreshing uh, time in that regard. So we hopefully will be able to be with you during that particular time as well. Been a couple of comments made with regard to the preacher and the preaching this week, and I mentioned that last night. And I, I, I mentioned just a while ago, somebody said, you know, they... They hated to see the meeting come to an end. I said, well, you know, what happens usually on the last night of the meeting, everything that I have not had time to say during the rest of the meeting, I'll go ahead and say it tonight. So I hope you've had supper. We'll be here a while. Now, if you haven't had a nap this afternoon, you may want to get one. That's all right. But we will, we will conclude on time. I'm just picking with you a little bit in that regard. Life is filled with difficulties, isn't it? As children of God, we know that the devil, our enemy, our adversary, is going to do everything that he can to discourage us from living a faithful Christian life. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so with all of the complications, the trials, the tribulations, the struggles that we face in life to be faithfully dedicated in service to God, even at best, we're by far from being perfect people. We make our mistakes. We let ourselves down. We let the elders down. We let the church down. But more importantly, we let God down often by the difficulties that we face and the way that we do not handle them quite so well at times. But you'll remember the statement of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 12. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what I want to try to do tonight, we, we've presented lessons throughout the, the meeting thus far to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help you better understand, you know, what is the priority of life? What is it that is really more important than anything else in life is. But tonight I want to encourage you as we think about encouragement from the past. In this particular study, that's exactly what I want us to do, is to, to go back to the past and see if we can find areas of encouragement to help us through whatever difficulty or disappointment that we may face in life. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race 
that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That particular section of Scripture is referring back, in essence, for the first part, is referring back to chapter 11. Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Those Old Testament characters that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, who by faith did what they did to please God and have their names in that record, in that section of that, that great faith section of the Bible, of those who were pleasing to God because their faith was a working and active faith. And then the second example that he gives in that context by way of encouragement is that of Christ himself, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, Jesus endured, but he endured because of the joy that was set before him. Brethren, tonight... We have joy in this life as children of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. But even beyond the joy of living the Christian life, we have a joy that is set before us of being with the Father eternally. That hope, the Hebrews writer said, is, is an anchor of the soul. Tonight, that's what I want us to think about. These characters of the past and the things that they faced in their lives are things that we often face in our lives. And when we see how they endured, when we see how they dealt with those issues in life, then hopefully it'll be an encouragement to us to simply say to me and simply say to you, whatever I face, with God's help, I can make it. I can overcome. I, I, can, I can see this thing through. I'm not going to let it get me down. And so when we begin to look at this section, going back into chapter 11, I want to begin our study with verse 4, in which it is said, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. When you look at this particular section, and of course you, you know when you, when you go back to Genesis chapter 4, you'll well remember the story of the, of the offerings of, of these two brothers, Cain and Abel. This particular verse reminds us of, of Abel's sacrifice, and I hope that you are aware when you, when you see the phrase, as we'll notice throughout this chapter, by faith, I know that you understand that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so when the Bible says of Abel that by faith he offered, it simply says to us that God had instructed these young men how to worship. Abel did exactly what God had said. The obvious is Cain did not. It's always been somewhat of a strange thing to me, although as we look at human nature, we see it happening over and over and over again. Why was it that Cain got upset with Abel? Abel wasn't the one who condemned his sacrifice. Abel wasn't the one who was displeased with his offering. It was God. He should have gotten angry with God, not Abel. But have you ever noticed in, in our day and time when, when people get mad at the message of God, generally they get mad at the messenger, not the message. I don't know why that is. That's strange. Because when we present God's Word, we're just, we're just telling you what God has said about the matter. And if you don't like what God says about it, don't get mad at me. Get mad at God and deal with God. Take it up with God. But what we have in Abel is this. And you'll notice on the screen, Matthew chapter 15, 
verses 8 and 9, which talks about the matter of worship. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the, the commandments of men. And so there is, there is worship that is acceptable to God, worship that is not acceptable to God. And these two young men show us a great example of that. One accepted, one was not accepted. And as a result, there was a family conflict between these two brothers resulting in the death of the righteous one. When we think about that story and we try to make application of it, how often is it among brethren today that we face some form of family opposition? But we understand from the teachings of our Lord that, you know, that, that that's going to happen at times. And Jesus made it very plain that, that in order for us to please Him, we must, we must love Him more than we love any family member. He that loveth father, mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He explains that a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So Jesus made it rather plain to start with that when we choose to serve God, it might not always be peaceful within our families. Especially we have folks in our families that are not worshiping God the way they ought to. I, I know several situations where you have a, a one family member that's a, that's a faithful child of God. You have a, another family member, maybe a brother or sister or father or mother, whatever the case might be, that is not a faithful child of God. And usually what you hear is this. We can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. Every time the subject of religion is brought up, it just brings about a big fuss. Well, isn't that what the Lord said? Man's foes shall be they of his own household. And so while that may not be a pleasant thought in that regard, yet that's exactly what Jesus told us was going to happen. Yet you'll notice in this context, it simply says, by faith, Abel. By faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul simply says that we walk by faith, not by sight. Those that intend to be with God eternally must continue to walk by the Word of God, by faith. You remember John said in 1 John 1, down about verse 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. As long as we continually walk, and I'm sure you've heard the explanations within that verse, if we walk in the light, that's continuous action verb. If we walk in the light, continue to walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, another continuous action verb. And so as long as we're walking in the light, there is that continual cleansing by the blood of Christ. So we've got to continue to walk. And so it may be tonight that there is someone in this audience, simply because you are a faithful child of God, you are not in good standing with somebody in your family because they're not in good standing with the Lord. How do you deal with that? Abel's encouragement to us is, you just go ahead and do what's right. Just do what's right. Just go ahead and, and walk by faith. Don't, don't be so discouraged. Don't, don't try to compromise. Don't try to make peace in the family when peace is not going to be possible if you're going to faithfully serve God. And let me say this. That is not always easy. When you've got a, a wife who is a faithful member of the body of Christ and her husband is a jerk, it's not always easy for her to be faithful in service to God. 
or when you have, have children who reach the age of accountability and, and through whatever influence they, they decide to become children of God and, and they're told by one parent or the other or both, you had better not be baptized into that church of Christ. If you do, you better find you a place to live. I've known of that happening before. You see, when we choose to serve God, we have made the most important choice in life. And when it causes family problems, Abel is our encouragement. Just go ahead and by faith, do what's right. You'll know when you do that you have pleased God. And He's the one you ought to be trying to please anyway, first and foremost. And by pleasing Him, you'll know that when judgment comes, you can hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the jaws of thy Lord. Isn't that what we're all about? Isn't that our desire tonight? Isn't that our hope tonight? That's where Abel would lead us in that regard. So if, if you have that kind of difficulty in your life, family opposition, because you're a faithful child of God, go back and read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Just do what's right. Then you come down to verse 7. And it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Sometimes when we read the, the study, and if you, you remember this, the, the story itself, going back to Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, uh, how God instructed Noah to build that ark, gave him specific instructions as how to build it, and warned him that there was going to be a flood, and you know that was going to be the means of salvation in that regard that, that Noah began to build. And it took him a long time to do it, 120 years. All of the time he was building, he was preaching, trying to get people to, to listen to, to the message of God that he had to deliver to them. But, but the masses would not hear. And when the floods began to come and the waters began to rise, you know well as I do how many people are on that ark. Eight souls. Eight souls. I've often heard preachers, I, I, I normally don't, don't get too dramatic with, with my preaching and uh, I'd, I'd make a mess of it if I did, I guess. But I, I've often heard preachers in, in talking about Noah and the building of the ark, what might have been going on around him, what, what the people of the world might have been saying to him while he was building that ark. I mean, you know, you, you're telling us there's going to be a flood and it's never rained before. What are you talking about? You know, you're going to build that ark and, and you expect us to get on it and, and, you know, probably calling him crazy and lost his mind and laughing at him and all of that and that's probably true i mean we know humanity too well don't we we know what happens when people have no respect for what what god says about anything they'll they'll just simply make fun of you i don't know what all was transpiring in that in that regard but i know this that when the doors closed out of all the people that were living only eight souls were saved. The masses would not hear. Do we face that today? When we're trying to proclaim the gospel of Christ, is it not true today that the masses will not hear? I mentioned earlier that, you know, in a, in a community like at Pulaski, uh, there, are, there are people somewhere out there who will hear the gospel of Christ if someone will take it to them. But, but you really have to search to find them, don't you? Because for the most part, people are not interested in studying with us anymore. I remember when I was in, in Bremen, Georgia, we had a, a big old building up there and, and the basement fellowship hall was as big as a big old fan-shaped building and and uh, we got, one of our men worked with the telephone company, and he got permission from the telephone company to run a heavy-duty line into our fellowship hall. And it had, you know, huge post pillars holding it up. And he ran a heavy line in there and put a box on one of those posts 
that would accommodate 12 telephones. And any time we had a gospel meeting, a lectureship, vacation Bible school, ladies' days, whatever we had going on, on Thursday night, Friday night, and all day Saturday, we would, we would get in a, just a little circle around that post with our telephones, and we'd work, we'd work in two-hour segments making phone calls to everybody in our area. We would make between three and 4,000 phone calls on Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. And I've done some research on this before we kind of put it in motion. And the reason we did it at the building is because if you try to do that at home and you get cussed out a couple of times or people, you know, uh, really fuss at you a couple of times, you're going to be reluctant to make a next phone call. <laughs> you're going to be discouraged. But if you're sitting around in a group and you tell everybody, boy, you won't believe what that guy just said to me. You know, and, and, and so you can just kind of, you know, sit back and relax and laugh about it, and then you're ready to make another phone call. The encouragement that we would get from one another. But the research that I found was this, and, and we would always offer a Bible correspondence course in, in addition to the advertisement that we were doing. And it went something like this. If you make, make 3,000 phone calls, you can expect only about 10% of the people that you call to agree to take a Bible correspondence course and you mail them that first lesson. Okay, if we make 3,000 phone calls on a weekend, we're going to mail out 300 lesson number one of the Bible correspondence course. And then statistics told us that, that when you start mailing those out, you've mailed out 300, that, that you'll be fortunate if 10% of that continues and completes the course. Well, now we're down to 30, aren't we? And then we were told beyond that that you will be very fortunate if 10% of those who complete the course ever respond to the Lord's invitation and are ever baptized into Christ. Now, you think that's not discouraging? <laughs> to say we're going to make 3,000 phone calls in three days and we might or might not have somebody to obey the gospel. So the masses are not going to hear. But you know what the Lord said for us to do? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We, we did what we could do. Once we put it in, in their hands, it's up to them to respond to it. I think I mentioned Acts 17 earlier this week where Paul preached in Athens. Some mocked. Some said, we'll hear you again. Some clave to him would indicate they obeyed the gospel. And, and so whatever the situation is, not everybody is going to hear what we do. And so when we get into these efforts of, of campaigns or whatever, if we're not careful, we'll get discouraged. But the encouragement is Noah saved his family. If we don't save anybody else, if we can save our own families, and I know a lot of families tonight who are beginning to wonder, will we be able to save our own families? We bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But whenever they reach a certain age, sometimes it's younger and younger, seem like, but, but they have a mind of their own. And when they reach that level where they are old enough to do it, they'll begin to make their own decisions. And they may or may not remain faithful to the Lord. That's discouraging. But the main concern that we have, number one, is that, that we get there. Noah got on that boat. He saved his family in that regard. Elders, preachers, Bible class teachers, we, we all face that, that same kind of thing. You know, I, I, I preach as hard as I can most of the time. And folks will walk out the door guilty of things that I've talked about in a particular lesson. They'll walk out and say, man, Sidney, that, that was a great lesson. I appreciate that. And they'll walk right out that door and go back to doing exactly what they did before they came in. That's discouraging. But I'm going to get to heaven if possible. 
And I'm going to take anybody with me that I can. And I'm going to try not to let all of the negative aspects of that discourage me from being in eternity with God. This life is over. And so, so you know, again, just do what's right. You teach and you preach and you encourage and you can do what you can do. And if folks don't listen, you have done the right thing anyway. You've tried to help them. It's now up to them. So don't let that discourage you. Then we move on down to verse 8, where it says that uh, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. And then it goes on to talk about his sojourn in that regard. So he was instructed, get out of your, you know, from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, in the land that I will show you. He's going to a strange land. He's going to a place as far as we know he's never been before. Incidentally, let me just stop right there. I, I see it on the screen. Uh, somebody asked Ann, I think it was early in the week, what does FF stand for? <laughs> verses following. And so if you see that, that, you know, verse 1 and verses following is what that stands for. And so Abraham is about to go out into a strange land, leave his father's house. What's his, what's his deal here? God said, I'll show you where to go. Abraham, according to what we can find, made no hesitation to do exactly what God said. His trust was in God. It wasn't in himself. It was in God. His trust was in the Lord in that regard. And so as you look at various passages of Scripture in that connection, you can find so many passages. I I only have one here, Psalm 40 and verse 4. But one of the messages over and over and over in the Psalms is trust in the Lord. Psalm 23 is a favorite passage of a lot of people in which the psalmist writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We recently went through a study of of Psalm 23 at home. Uh, We we spent about uh, eight or ten weeks on that one psalm. Because of the personal pronoun, and I emphasize that almost in every class, I would begin the class by saying, The Lord is... And then I would stop in order to give the class the opportunity to say, my shepherd. The Lord is one in whom we can trust. He will lead us in the paths of righteousness. He will show us. Matter of fact, the psalmist again said, thy word with regard to God, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway in in that regard. So he's going to a strange land. He's got to to trust in the Lord in that regard. One other comment about that before I move on to to Joseph in that section. You know, sometimes we have have some good friends, and I I just use this as one example. We We have a good friend who is a good gospel preacher. But he had to stay in a certain area simply because his wife would not move. She did not want to leave her children. She did not want to leave her grandchildren. She wanted to stay in that particular area. So he, had to, he wound up going into business for himself. Well, he worked for somebody else for a while, then into business for himself in order to continue to preach for a congregation that couldn't support him. So he kind of had to support himself along the way. To me, that's sad. We don't have more trust and confidence in God to go wherever we need to go to preach the gospel in that regard. So we face those kinds of things along the way in our lives. We need to put our trust in God. Then you move on down to to verse 22 of Hebrews 11. And it says, By faith Joseph, when he died made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment 
concerning his bones. By faith, Joseph. Now, there's some others in there. You realize we're not going to cover every character tonight. Time wouldn't permit, permit that. But in this particular situation, and, and in Genesis chapter 39 especially, you have Joseph eventually coming into Pharaoh's, uh, uh, under Pharaoh's jurisdiction, if you please. He's been sold down into Egypt. He's now been made basically ruler over, over everything in Egypt. Uh, and now he's got to deal with, with Potiphar's wife. And you know the situation, the story, how, how she would, would try to seduce him to get him, as the Scripture says, to lie with her. And at the beginning, Joseph said no. You remember the, how we, when the drug problem first began to, to develop and we heard more and more about it, the thing was just say no. Well, that's exactly what Joseph did to begin with. And then as you read on down through that context, you'll, you'll find that she didn't give up so easily. And so she kept on day after day saying to him, come lie with me. And if you'll notice in the context, he wouldn't listen to her. He said no. Then he refused to listen to her. She didn't give up. Eventually he said, uh, I, I just can't be around her anymore. You know, he had to separate himself from, from that temptation. She didn't give up. And ultimately he had to flee out of her presence. Because she got his coat, you know, you, you know the story, created problems for him for a while. But you see, Joseph faced temptations. But I can tell you something else. Temptations are going to come our way as well, aren't they? We, we sing the song, Yield Not to Temptation. The Lord, when He was instructing His disciples how to pray, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you ever pray that, that concept in your prayers, Lord? Please lead me away from temptation. Don't allow me to yield to the temptations of life. We need to be praying that on a regular basis because you remember we do have an enemy. We do have an adversary who's trying to destroy your soul and mine. And so we don't want to, we don't want to yield to that in that regard. In James chapter 1, verses 12 and following, there's that FF again. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And of course, the ultimate of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 6. And what we need to understand from that is God does not tempt us. Whatever God does for us is good for us. So don't, don't blame God when we're tempted. Remove ourselves from that temptation in, in that regard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 12 and 13, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then Paul went on to say in, in verse 13 that God is not going to tempt us above what we're able to bear. God will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now please keep in mind Paul did not say, God will make you escape. He said, God will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I heard a very interesting observation. If you keep on reading in that chapter, one of the very next things you're going to find is the need to, to flee idolatry. Have you ever wondered what the connection is in that regard? Here we're dealing with, you know, take heed lest you fall. You're not going to be tempted above your able. The Lord's going to make a way of escape. Then he says something about fleeing idolatry. If I understand the context correctly, and it is in the context, there are people who believe that they are the only ones that ever face the problem that they're facing. You ever talk to anybody that's got some 
some, maybe even a little bit of a rare disease. Well, nobody's ever had this. I, I'm the only one I've ever known about to have this disease. They're the only ones that ever had it. Well, I tell you what, there have been a lot of people who've had the flu, but they have never had it as bad as I've had it. You, you know the attitude that, that a lot of folks have. Whatever they have, whatever their problem is, it's worse, it's greater than anybody else ever has. And some people are that way spiritually. They think that their temptation, their difficulties as a Christian are worse than anybody else has ever had to face. Now you think about it. If that is the case, that your problem spiritually is worse than anybody else's has ever been, then God is going to have to deal with you personally in a way that He's never dealt with anybody else. You have, in essence, become an idol unto yourself. You think think nobody else is anything like you before. So God's going to have to deal with you differently than everybody else. I think that's the context. God is going to provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And that's, that's the context there of Joseph in that regard. So, yes, you're going to face trials, tribulations. You're going to face temptations. But go back and read the story of Joseph. And that will be an encouragement to you. I can overcome this. I can deal with this. Is it going to be easy? Maybe not. But I can deal with it. Joseph did with God's help. Then you'll notice as well, uh, there in verse, uh, uh, and that that should be uh, Moses in verses 23, 24, and 25. Uh, It's interesting, isn't it, Jonathan? How many times we proof things and sometimes just <laughs> we just don't get it right anyway. But anyway, that, that ought to be verses 23, uh, 24, and 25. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not, afra- and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was uh, come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather that to enjoy the uh, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season so what do you have with Joseph here or Moses you have an opportunity you go back to Exodus 2 and you can read all of that Moses had an opportunity for a position of prominence he had, a, he had an opportunity for position, if you please, if he had just stayed under the influence of Pharaoh's house. But he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. I believe there are times in our lives when we have the opportunity to better ourselves materially at the expense of ourselves spiritually. Better paying job. You know, I, I, don't, I don't blame anybody for wanting to better themselves. I mean, that, you know, that, that's kind of what it's all about, you know. But if our trying to better ourselves materially is going to affect us spiritually, we better think twice. Because you see, that better paying job might be one that causes you to have to work on Sundays and, and there goes your opportunities to worship God. Or that, that better paying job might cause you to compromise some of your principles and cause you to, to participate in things that are, that are wrong. But that money sometimes talks, don't it? Causes us to want that better paying job. I, I've known of preachers who have compromised their beliefs, their faith, in order to maintain a job that they wanted. You know, they're, they're, within a, they're in a big congregation. They're getting a big salary. You know, I mean, everything is going well for them. And, but they know if they preach on certain things, they're out the door. Any preacher that has that attitude ought to quit preaching tonight. Paul said, I've determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And then he said to those Ephesian elders, I've shunned not to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I don't mean to be ugly. But I've, I've told elders before. 
don't ever start telling me what I can and can't preach. Don't, don't even go there. Now, with this exception, the elders may be working with some situation in the congregation. And they may come to me and they may say, Now, Sidney, you know, we've, we've got this situation we're trying to work with right now, and we, we think we're making progress, whatever, and we, we think it would be best right now if you just kind of, you know, didn't preach on that. Let us go ahead and, and, and see if we can handle this okay. And if we can, great. If we can't, then somewhere down the road, you, you probably need to preach on it. And I've had elders to do me that way. And I don't have a problem with that. But just to tell me, you don't, don't you ever preach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage in this congregation. Don't go there. But I've known preachers who would accept that and not preach on that subject in order to keep a good paying job. They ought to resign today. I actually had a member of the church to tell me one time something not to preach on. Matter of fact, when I moved back to Gardner, one of the elders' wives in a, in a conversation, just family matters, she said, Sidney, I'm going to make one request of you, okay? She said, for the first six months that you're here, please do not even use the word hell. I said, really? What's this all about? Well, apparently the former preacher, that's about all he ever preached on was hell and how if they didn't straighten up, they were going to hell and all that kind of stuff. And she said, that's all we've heard. We've heard it enough for a while. Well, it was funny. I, you know, I, I, a lot of my sermons have hell in them, but, but I would always try to find a different word to use so I would not have to use the word hell for the first six months. And then when she'd come out to her, I'd say, did you notice I didn't use the word hell today? And she said, oh, I heard what you said. But that's not what we're talking about. We have to preach the gospel of Christ. Every bit of it. We can't leave it out in that regard. We do not need to go against the Word of God. And so there are people who just go along to get along, whatever the case may be, in, in that regard. So when you face that difficulty in your life, go back and read about Moses. Let him be an encouragement to you. I don't need that job. I don't need that position. I need to faithfully serve God, and if I take that job, if I take that position, that's going to interfere. I don't need that. Let Moses encourage you in that regard. So whether, whether you're talking about family issues, whether you're talking about people not wanting to hear the gospel anymore, whether you, whether you talk about uh, things in life where you don't understand how it's going to work out, so you've got to put your faith and trust in God, whether it's temptations you're facing in life, whether it's opportunity, whether it's prominence, whether, whatever it is in life that you're facing. I believe if you'll go back and read Genesis chapter 11, you'll find encouragement from various characters who, according to the text, by faith, did what God wanted them to do. Let that be an encouragement to you. Now, here's the rest of the lesson. That's the introduction. Here's the rest of the lesson. We've, you see all the... No, I'm just kidding. There, there are so many other characters mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 that can serve as examples in other areas, but I think I've given you enough that you can see how these characters can be an encouragement to you. So whether it's you know, whether it's Rahab or Gideon or Barak or, or any of those others. And you'll notice the, the Bible says in that regard that time would fail me. And that's, that's where we are right now. <laughs> time would fail me to discuss all of those in the same light that we've discussed the others as we have tonight. But I believe, I believe we can, can, can gain some great encouragement from these characters of the past who by faith did what God wanted them to do in spite of the difficulties that they faced. Let them be an encouragement to you. If you're, if you're not a child of God tonight, think about that little phrase, by faith. If you've never become a child of God, you're not living your life by faith. Because you see, faith will cause you to do what God wants you to do. 
and as one who's never been and never been uh, become a child of God, a faith in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God ought to lead you to turn away from sin, confess that faith, then you can be buried in baptism, have the guilt of sin washed away, be raised to walk in newness of life. When you've done that, you have done that by faith. What about your life as a child of God? Have you become discouraged? Are there things in your life that, it, that have kind of gotten you down? Things in your life that, that you basically say, I, don't, I, I just don't know how to deal with this. And you need to go back and read Gen- uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and see if one of those characters can lend to you the encouragement that you need to be strong and faithful in service to God. And if we'll all do that, when time is no more, we'll be able to enjoy fellowship together eternally with God. If you're not ready for that tonight, why don't you prepare as we stand together and sing the song of invitation.